we really succeeded against all odds. When I look back at it, I'm like, how the hell did we ever get a show on air? And that's prof- that that also is profound. But like, I was so deeply sad when it was over. And I was like, this is going to keep happening. Ups and downs, losses, wins. And I just like, what am I like if i feel it this deeply is is there is there something else like do i want to give this kind of thing this much importance in my life it it shouldn't come at my own personal sacrifice of health or happiness or my family's Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Today's chat is a real treat. This is a great story of finding one's path and the resilience involved in walking the desired path. Lennon has a great outlook on life. She's humble, funny, and really kind. I had a blast. I found chatting with Lennon relaxing and comforting to the soul. She's a real pro and I adore her. So let's get into it and introduce today's amazing guest. Lennon Parham is an actor, comedian, writer and producer. She can be seen opposite Ophelia Loveybond and Jake Johnson in the HBO Max comedy Minx about the fictional creation of the first erotic magazine for women in 1970s LA. Prior to that, she was a series regular in the ABC sitcom Bless This Mess. Previously, she created and starred in her own show, Playing House, and has reoccurred as Julia Louis-Dreyfus' hilarious senior advisor, Karen Collins, on HBO's Veep. She can also be seen rocking the shoulder pads as Liz Fleming, the feminist maths teacher at William Penn Academy on Schooled, the 90s spin-off of The Goldbergs. Additionally, Lennon has made a number of memorable appearances on television, including Curb Your Enthusiasm, Documentary Now, Ghosted, Review with Forrest McNeil, Lady McDynamite, Mad Men, and Parks and Recreation. If you listen closely, you can hear her dulcet tones giving voice to characters on animated shows like Bob's Burgers, Little Big Awesome, Animals, and Adventure Time, as well as the cult favorite podcast, Womp It Up. On the feature side, she's also had flashy supporting roles in The House, Horrible Bosses 2, Confessions of a Shopaholic, and Other People. More recently, Lennon directed two episodes on the second season of Bless This Mess. She's also directed an episode of Playing House. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, such as red carpet nightmares, being an improv guru, being a teacher, fear, not getting into SNL, creating a one-woman show, coaching, happiness, success, and shows that get cancelled, all in a playful and very funny manner. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure. So check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5pm Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. Uh, I was thinking whether we should start with this. I know people say that they don't Google themselves, but you yeah. humbly admitted that, I think this was maybe a year ago, that you Googled yeah. yourself. Yeah, for sure. I do it all the time. Nothing comes it's up. It's a but terrible, we'll terrible thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard this story and it, I've been thinking about it ever since, that you Googled, I think there's a robot that says your name incorrectly. Like one oh, of those, yeah. I don't remember it. Uh, this is very, uh, Okay. Yeah, I, it doesn't, <laughs> I, it rings a bell, but I don't have like a good story to go with it. It just, I think, 
Why would I have done that? I don't know. I think this robot, because you've got a unique name, Lennon. Yeah, sure. It's this like robot that pronounces your name incorrectly. Right. So they already right. have something set up to pronounce your name, but it's incorrect. Yeah, right. Well, my name, uh, to be honest, has been a challenge <laughs> for a lot of people. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm not, I, I'm a fan of it, but like, you kind of, if you don't know who I am and you just hear my name, you don't really know what you're getting, like what, what gender, what ethnicity and like, who knows, you know? Um, and I have like, there was one significant moment <laughs> in my life. I've talked about it on a, uh, I can't remember when I talked about it, but I, I said it would be a good talk show story, but I have yet to tell it on a, on a talk show. But um, I went to, uh, so my very first sitcom accidentally on purpose with Jenna Elfman, I played her weird sister and it was a, a, a really fun show. It was a multicam, which is filmed in front of a live studio audience. And it was just like, a dream come true. And she invited me, this was after our show. She had invited me to go to this women in film event that she was invited to. And I was going to be her guest, which just felt like so such a big deal. That's very nice. And I wore literally an old bridesmaid's dress (laughs) (laughs) and I had never been to any kind of carpet or red carpet or anything before. And I, um, at that point, Jessica, my writing partner and I, Jessica St. Clair had, we, we knew that our show Best Friends Forever was going to be picked up to series on NBC. So um, I had something to talk about, but nobody knew anything about who I was <laughs> and not one single person wanted to talk to me. And now when you go to those events, you usually when you're further along in your career, a lot of times you'll hire a publicist to come with you. And those folks are invaluable um, in that they help you know who to talk to. They've already like prepped the person with why they should feel like talking to you. Ah, interesting. And, you know, you, you pay for them monthly. So you don't always have them with you when, when you need them. But for, so for this event, I didn't even know what that, what that that was a job that existed so jenna's publicist uh sidled me with somebody some random like carpet person that was like helping facilitate the event and then she walked me down and like all the interviewers like shook their head no i don't want to talk to her i don't want to talk i don't know who this person wow. is. and then finally one guy who was an improv like nerd <laughs> <laughs> and wrote for some like, I don't remember what he even wrote for, but it was like, you know, some small Im- like blog. And he was like, I, I know who she is. And so he, we had this great conversation and it was so fun. And then we got to the part where they take all the photographs and there's like 40 photographers. And I'm already feeling self-conscious because I've done my own hair and makeup. I'm in a bridesmaid's dress. Like the shoes are, they don't fit anymore. The elastic's gone out of them. It's, it was great. Um, And I got there and the woman announced me and she came up in front of me and she said, "Uh, this is lemon parsnips. (laughs) (laughs) I was not expecting that. And I was like, oh, Oh. okay. That makes so much sense. Like she's been introducing me as lemon parsnips to every single one of these people. And they've no idea who I am. I don't know if they would have known my real name anyway, but like, of course, why would you ever want to talk to someone? I would. <laughs> I mean, unless That's the you're greatest, me. It's the I know, gre- I know. Greatest name of So all then time. I, I said, I said, thank you so much. I said, actually, my name is Lennon Parham. This is like in front of 40. <laughs> and the, whoever's like waiting on deck and whoever's getting their photograph taken, I'm like, my name is Lennon Parham. I just starred in Accidentally on Purpose on it, uh, you know, on CBS. And I have a new show called Best Friends Forever coming out on NBC. And uh, so if you want to take my picture, go right ahead. <laughs> they did. Anyway, it was an insane, an insane experience. <laughs> that is the greatest story I've ever heard. That name, surely your friends should call you that. That should be your nickname for life. 
I know. Jessica calls me that a lot. She calls me le- lemon parsnips. Lemon parsnips. Oh. She likes to she likes to tell that story. And then so I'll meet somebody for the first time and they'll be like, oh, I heard about lemon parsnips. And I'm like, Jess, <laughs> like, let me tell it. Uh, well, I want to get into your relationship in a second, but that is brilliant. I've heard so many stories on the red carpet and yeah. all of them are hilarious. Like one guy is on the yeah. red carpet and one of like the big interviewers, or I don't know how this works. I've never been on the red carpet, quickly calls him over. It's like, we got a big interview, calls him over and realizes yeah. he's completely the wrong person to who we thought he was. Calls him a different name <laughs> and asks him about a movie he's never, <laughs> never been in. Oh my God. That has happened yeah. a lot. The, the, here's, here's my other red carpet nightmare story. And this, this is special. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, Jess and I talked a, a lot, especially during the promotion of Best Friends Forever and also playing house about our love for Channing Tatum. And so um, nice. specifically him, his dancing to Pony and, and Magic Mike. So um, Genuine's Pony. So our publicist thought it would be a great idea to get us. This is our publicist for USA. I think. Is, is this a different publicist to the one that yes. was calling? Okay. Yes. Cause I, I'd have never saw that woman again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she gets us invited to the premiere of magic Mike XL, which wow. is, you know, obviously the sequel Jada Pinkett Smith, Channing Tatum, the whole, and it was on, Hollywood Boulevard, Grauman's Chinese Theater, like the whole nine yards, huge. They blocked off the whole street. We had like stylists. We had gotten our hair and makeup done. It was like a really big deal. So I show up on time. 45 minutes later, Jessica shows up. (laughs) And by that time, they stagger the arrivals, right? Because they don't want the people who are lower on the totem pole to arrive at the same time as the big stars. Mm. So they want the, like, they want C list, B list, then a list. Right. So we arrive and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And then, Oh no, Jada Pinkett Smith comes. And so <laughs> she starts going down the carpet and I'm like, I mean, I felt beautiful. I loved my outfit That's and my great. dress, but we, but I, but I could like, I can't go down the carpet without Jess. So then anyway, she, she arrives just as Jada's taking her, her mark down the carpet. So we start on a carpet down pat behind Jada. Well, then Channing Tatum arrives. Wow. So now we're in a Jada Pinkett Smith Channing Tatum sandwich and no one wants to take our picture. They know who we are. They just don't care. At least they They're know who you are interested. this time. That's true. Because our USA publicists had written our names on the back of our ticket envelope in what looked like only a serial killer could write. <laughs> the handwriting of a serial killer. <laughs> so anyway, we make, our, we make our way down. We finally, we, we, we leapfrog past Jada because like she's, you know, obviously more Hello, important. And yeah, Sure. And then we get to the part where the interviews are and we see a a woman who's always been kind to us and she calls us over to interview us. And next to her, I think it was a gentleman from People Magazine. I don't know. I I saw his name tag briefly, but for some reason he was upset with me and he looked at me as I'm doing the interview with our good friend and made the motion of like a gun and he shot it off into his head. Wow. And I was like, I, we got to get out of here. <laughs> this is not, something Whoa. is not right. Something is not right here. <laughs> I'm speechless. Did, something wicked this way comes. <laughs> did you ever find out why he was doing that? Or was No, you know what? I think I Googled him. Listen to me Googling. I think I couldn't find him. I think I like in that moment, it was too insane to like contemplate. And then I think later, you know, a lot of these magazines have so many people working for them. So it was, it would have been really hard for me to find exactly him, but I have in the years since every once in a while, I'll Google (laughs) people magazine. Well, he sounds like an absolute mensch and congratulations that you're now 
very well known and that Jada <laughs> is like below you guys. So congratulations to you and your writing oh, partner. Man, thank you so much. I I have so much to say, but it just sounds like crazy on the red carpet and so many things happen. It'll be so fast moving. <laughs> I'm sure Channing Tatum bowed down to you guys as well. Oh yeah, yeah, right. There's there it is a real um yeah, those those red carpets really do have a way of making you, you know, making you know your place or whatever. And it's really event specific, you know, depending on what it is um, and why you're there. Like if you're in the movie, it feels very different than if you're just attending as a, as a friend of the movie, you know? Yeah. Um, But isn't that interesting to me, if you're not part of the movie, isn't it all about the movie or do they want to get as many celebrities as possible to build up the hype? Yeah, I think they do that. They invite people, you know, if, if, if it's a premiere, they invite, you know, hot celebs or friends of celebs, you know, to come see it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that, <laughs> that again per, per se. We've, we've heard the many highs and lows here and uh, some of the, the guests mentioned that they went to like the pre drinks or something and just got hammered with the team and actually missed the red carpet event. And they had like, Oh pre- yeah. Oh. I'm sure that happens all the time too. Yeah. Sometimes I'll get dressed up and go to support a friend and not do the red carpet. Cause I just don't have it in me to explain why it's important, you know, or I don't want to like look into the eyes of a photographer who's like, searching their head for like who is she and with the you know like i don't want that that ego check that day yes that- it's just enough it's just enough for me to go and see the people who've completed this amazing craft of you know a comedy and just like have them say like love your jumpsuit you know <laughs> well that so that then you get the just the confidence from that aspect that's very nice yeah and in terms of googling yourself is that still a dangerous game for you? Have you found anything where you're like, oh, I shouldn't do this anymore? I just, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I still do it. I think it's a bad habit. I don't do it as often. Um, yeah, like sometimes, like sometimes I'll, like if I am working with a new hair person and I want to show them like, how I've had my hair that I like, and I wanted to give them like reference photos. I'll Google like Google search image, but then that's also hard because then you're seeing yourself like through the past two decades, you know? Um, Mm. But yeah, there's just always some rando, you know, saying something that is potentially hurtful. And even if you, like, I remember when Twitter came out, I was so, ex- like, so, you know, so excited to get involved with everybody. Because also as a live comedian, you're used to that, like, in, like, instant feedback. Like, how is this going? Do people like it? Oh, they do. They laughed. Oh, they, they didn't like that one. Okay, I'll go a different direction. Or maybe they didn't understand it. I didn't, ex- you know, I didn't set it up right. Um, but when you do television the only indication that you have that it's succeeding is like the little shoulder shake from the camera department. So um, if they're laughing, they maybe give a little shimmy shake, you know? So I guess I was probably looking for that external validation. Like this is going well, this is, you're doing it right. She's funny. She deserves this. Um, And most of the people said nice things. I, you know, even on Twitter, I've been very lucky. I'm going to say this in jinx and I'm not going with right now. <laughs> even on Twitter, I've been very lucky. Very rarely will I get a rude comment. Every once in a while I do. And I usually write back, Oh, which really turns the tables. It does. <laughs> I'll just say like once someone said, oh, so we, a good friend of ours is Melissa Roush and she's on the big bang theory and she's yep. just phenomenal. She's a few, she's like phenomenal human as well as comedian and she had i think tweeted about maybe playing house or something similar uh, one of and those, said yeah. check you know check it out my my friends made this show and someone wrote back like uh w- watch 30 minutes biggest waste of my life 
<laughs> like something like that. And so I just wrote back because I was like tagged. So I just oh. wrote back. I just wrote back. Hey, I'm so sorry you didn't like it. Maybe try one more episode. I, I think you'll get hooked or something like that. And she just was like, oh my God, I didn't know you were tagged in this. <laughs> she was like, I will. I'll look, at, I'll look it up. So I guess I like to give people <laughs> the benefit of the doubt, you know. I think that's a great tactic because now she's going to feel embarrassed and she's going to watch the whole season. She has to out of obligation. Yeah. And then by the end of that, if you don't like me, then that's not my fault. You yeah, know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that we just were never meant to be. That's, that's exactly okay. right. I'm glad that you have mostly positive comments, which is the case of most people, but it's always that one comment out of a hundred. No, it's, can... And it sticks. It sticks in your craw. Mm. Ha- yeah. Have you, I would actually imagine though, I might be jumping the gun. You alluded to this before and I know you're very humble, but you are an improv guru, a God. And so a God, a God. I've heard Michael. From many, many people. Would that also help? And, you know, being in the comedian space help with that because you have to deal with so much mm. like highs and lows, especially beginning can really destroy the confidence at stages. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is like a, a leveler, like for sure. Um, you know, we used to do, we used, I used to tour with the UCB touring company and we would uh-huh. go to colleges. And like, at this point I've maybe been in like a craft bagel fools commercial. Like you wouldn't know me, you know, but I'm teaching class. I feel good at it. I'm in the touring company. I'm getting paid to improvise um, and have an insane weekend at like Litchfield college or whatever. Um, and if you like, if you step out of line and make a joke that these college kids don't like, it's your first joke out of the gate. It's a lot harder <laughs> the rest of the show. Imagine, yeah. And then you're just like digging yourself out of this hole, you know? Um, yeah, it's a, it, it is, it keeps you humble. It, you have to like really, and the audiences like at a college show are very different than like the, the, the improv students that come to like Herald night on Tuesday night who like, speak the language and get the like subtle nuanced moves and like you're rewarded for like smart character work and like callbacks. Whereas if you do it on a Saturday night to a drunken like crowd, it's a very different thing. You have to kind of handhold them and say like, here's the funny thing here. It is again. And this is why it's funny. Remember it was funny the first time here. we Oh, and there it is again. Are we laughing? We love it. You know? So, uh, yeah, for sure. It keeps you, keeps you on your toes. It also teaches you how to kind of like, keep it, keep it fresh every take, you know, when you're doing performances and then on television or, or film, you know? Oh, interesting. And in terms of when you're starting out, cause no one's great when they first start, maybe there's like one person and you yeah. do start with that one bad joke at that college campus. Would yeah. you be in your head or were you at a stage where you had tactics and skills? Uh, n- yeah, I would be in my head for sure. I would be in my head. Um, I think I had early on, I had enough small successes. Like I, I did like improv for the first time in high school and it was like a part of a, co- a short form comedy sports like we'd been doing it in our acting classes exercises but then there was a competition um from high, between high schools for comedy sports and we competed in these short form games and i uh i succeeded at that and it felt it felt very good oh. um and in a different way than i had been kind of rewarded like as a as a performer like it felt like oh i do i can do this like as good or better than any of these other people. And it felt like a specific skill, if that makes sense. So, um, but then again, I didn't do it again until I didn't do that particular thing until I guess when I moved to New York uh, after college and after um, I took a two year break to do, to teach for teach for America after college. And then I moved to New York and then I immediately enrolled in second city they had a new york program and i also 
a couple of years later started taking uh, class at UCB at the Upright Citizens Brigade. So, um, yeah, and I, but I also got to see improv. So I lived in Chicago for a summer and um, one of my, one of the alumni from my college was Jack McBrayer. That the and guy he from was, 30 Rock? Yeah. yeah. He's one of the funniest people of, of all time. And oh. he was uh, performing at the time at the Improv Olympic, which is, you know, a big, big deal in Chicago. And so I would go see him do shows and play, you know, like after afterwards, it's just like improvisers, like doing bits, you know, like at a bar or whatever. And it, I always felt at home and he had said to me, I think you would be really good at this. And so I kind of kept that in my mind. So when I moved to New York and then he went on to be on second, to do second city. Um, and so when I moved to New York, I, I saw second city and I was like, Oh, that's the one Jack does. And that's Intr also all, where all the SNL folks went, you know? Okay. I've, we have to break this down because I've written like 80 points. <laughs> you, you've glossed through a few things. Let's just start maybe from the beginning. So what brought you to New York? Uh, well, I wanted to be an actor and it was either LA or New York. And so after like in my last year of teaching, I just, I visited LA and I visited New York and I decided that New York was calling to me. Um, and so I went there. And where did you teach French? at Teach for America. Was that in LA Green, or New York? That was in Greenville, Mississippi. Oh. Uh, for two years, I taught high school French at TL Weston High School. And I did community theater at the Delta Center stage. And um, it was wonderful. So you mentioned you took a two-year gap. Yeah. What was the reasoning behind that? I, I felt like I still had some growing up to do. I felt like I had lived a pretty sheltered life and I needed to kind of like have a little bit of adult time. Um, I had not gotten into the grad schools that I had my heart set on for theater. Um, and I had gotten a couple of callbacks, but they were, I just wasn't excited about them, but I had also kind of randomly applied to this teach for America program. And, uh, and I kept getting through to the next level and round. And so as my college career was ending and I didn't have my, um, a grad school thing lined up, I, I got the notification that I had, you know, been chosen to be one of the teachers from teach for America. And, uh, that they had placed me in the Mississippi Delta um, teaching high school French. And I was like, what? Because the plan was the plan was to go teach near like a metropolitan area that had like an acting community that I could then kind of work my way into. Uh, but the, but the, you know, the greater good had, had something else in mind. And um, was, sorry, was French always the goal to teach French? Uh, no, I had applied to teach like theater. They, they didn't offer me that there were, of course, nobody needs theater teachers, like in, in a school with low resources, like they definitely don't have a theater program, but, um, they do have a foreign language requirement. And so, um, I had minored in French. I had a double, not to brag, <laughs> Michael, <laughs> but I had a double minor in French and voice. A voice, and, and I had a and I got a BA in um, in arts, a B Bachelor of Arts. You are killing with it a, with a focus on performance and directing. That is, that is very exciting. <laughs> French and does anyone in your family speak French? No, that not is, a single person. So why French? I used to be I able to speak it. French. Okay, you go on. did. Not, I can't I have spoken it. in 10 years. See, this is just like the, the music. You got to return. You got to, you got to return to it. We were talking you off gotta... air that I used to play <laughs> some musical instruments. My French is horrible. I did exchange in France for 
Yes, you did. How long? <sighs> Two months. Wasn't that and long. And where were you? Oh, I, my, I actually can't pronounce it. My pronunciation sucks, but it's even worse. I'm going to say the English way. Is it okay. the Luau Valley? Yeah. Yep. That's where I was. And I can't remember anything more. I was actually really scarred because no one wanted to speak French to me. They all wanted to speak English. Speak English. Of and course. I would, I had to like tell them I'm not speaking to you. Then when they did, we'd learned like very grammatically correct <laughs> French and yeah. slang. I'm like, what language is this? Oh, yes. I found it so hard. And yeah. I already was the worst in my class. I shouldn't have been allowed. I did it in my final year, which I shouldn't uh-huh. have. I was so bad. But in your final year of college or school, high school, high school. Yeah. 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 So you were like 18 or 17. Yeah. And I was a year older, which is a bit weird. Mm-hmm. And people were, were you just, living with a family. I was living with the family and ow, it was just because my French was so bad and I was, I just wouldn't speak English. The communication gaps, they thought I would have been really rude, but I just couldn't communicate properly. Yeah. Yeah. One time they asked, there's so many stories, but this one always I makes really me am laugh. feeling for you deeply right now. <laughs> yeah, it was so, the, the family asked where I'm from and my family's South African, but I didn't know how to say South African. So yeah. I just said, I'm African. And they all burst out <gasps> laughing and pointed to their wrists to imply the color. Oh, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm African. I'm African. And they, that's pro, that was like day one. And it all went downhill from there. Oh, no. And another thing that just sprung to mind, I don't think I've told anyone this. You needed ID cards. Maybe you have to do that in America, but in Australia, you don't. You needed ID cards to get into the school and they have checkpoints off everywhere. Yeah. And mine won. There's, this was like a proper driver's license. Mine was a piece of paper, black and white, with the picture stuck on crooked. Mm. And so they thought I was a fake student because I don't have any color. It's a piece of paper. Anyone could have made it up. And so every single time they would get security and start questioning me and then I'd have to go to English. And this would happen almost every single day because they obviously rotated and just, and they wouldn't give me a proper, wow. proper ID card. It's a good Who time. wouldn't give it to you? This well, was I the program. This is like a program. The program fault. couldn't be bothered. Like whatever you're leaving yeah. soon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget that how sounds he, traumatic. <laughs> yeah. My French teacher was not impressed when I came back and can barely, barely of give a Of course, because nobody would speak to you in French. I know, but that's, that's not good enough. Money well spent. I still learned a lot. So it's-, it's a big experience. I did. So I lived with a family for a month. The, the daughter lived with us in Atlanta and, oh. uh, and she went with all the other French students to like amusement parks every day for a while. I could tell like the mall, like they, right. And then I go over there. I'm living with her family every day. I have to go to school. Like I'm in a, I'm, I'm with my other, the other students, but we're taking like French class together with the professor that came over with us. And it was a month long and it was in um, the center of the country. It's a little town called Aurillac yep. and it's in the Massif Central. It's oh, called. you have a great accent. I can already. I, lo- I do love the sound of language. Um, I like to make it sound right. So I would need to get back onto this timeline because there's just so much here. <laughs> you took the two years off. You didn't get into the grad programs. Yeah. Were you thinking that acting was done or you? I was sad. I remember feeling disappointed because a lot of my, co- you know, a lot of the ki- kids, a lot of the other of my friends were getting into programs and, uh, you know, uh, students from previous generations had gotten into programs as well. And, and I had my sight set on like really specific ones. And so when I didn't get acceptance there, you know, I, I did, I, I remember feeling really sad and disappointed. And then, so I was like, well, that's not an option. So what is an option? Um, and, you know, these, uh, these things were an option. Like there were a couple, like a resi- like a, like a residential residential theater repertory theater where you would like go to school but also you're kind of in their companies you're performing yeah. in a couple of places and they just weren't I don't know I just wasn't feeling like lit up about it and 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 this teach for america thing was really intriguing and and it did light me up and I felt oh I'd always thought like I'd always thought you know I could I would love to do some kind of uh, give back 
thing, like a, you know, like a Peace Corps thing, but I felt like I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't made of strong enough stuff to like go overseas, like mm -hmm. for two years. Um, but this, when the AmeriCorps program came out and, and the Teach for America, I was like, this I could do. I've always loved teaching. I've always loved kids. Like, like this I could do. And if this is helpful in some way to my students or to the school or the district or whatever. And then also I, I, I felt like I needed some growing up and um, before I kind of moved to New York or LA or whatever to try to get into the rat race. It's very mature of you to have that awareness because pretty much, I think I've had quite a few of your friends or people that you know on this podcast, but literally yeah. very few people get into their first option. And then when they don't get in, they do other things, for example, like yeah. teaching like you. And yeah. that really teaches them a lot about themselves. And actually, yeah. you know, you mentioned lit you up, pushes you it back into the position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just find that really interesting. Were you, yeah, to have that maturity and awareness, or were you just, were you feeling lost? Or you're like, no, I need to actually you, learn these skills. I don't remember. I don't remember the exact feeling. I know I was like, I know it was dis I know it was really disappointing because I thought I thought that was the path I was supposed to be on and but it's just like like what am I gonna do like I can't like call Yale and be like hey dudes made a mistake you know <laughs> um, so I was just trying to to do the thing that felt exciting and and felt felt right next and and I think when I you know in Mississippi I I did learn. The thing that I learned really quickly was how to, what I needed at bare minimum to survive and to be happy. Um, because the first semester was really, really, really hard. How so? And I was literally teaching. I would go, I would go to school and I would come home and I would go to school and I would come home and there was nothing else in my life. And I started to realize like, Oh, that's not, I can't do that. And so I, there was a, a brilliant community theater in the area. And so I decided to audition for, I think it was Narnia or something like I had, and I had gone, my friend took me to see it, like, um, took me to see like a production of like greater tuna or something. And then, um, I was like, well, this is a great theater. I should. And so then I did, you know, I began perform, and I, then from then on out, I was in everything that they did the whole time I was there. And I just met the most brilliant, wonderful people. And, and also I brought theater to the high school. Ooh. So I started, I took over the theater. There was like a, a tradition of like a senior play, but that was kind of it. And so, um, I took that over. We did a Christmas carol and then we did a full out production of Once on this Island my second year there that to this day makes me cry. Um, out of joy? Yeah, it was just so moving. The kids were so talented and I just was like, I, it just, it's just meaningful to me to, to have them all participate in, oh. in that, in that, yeah. I'm I'm sure that also seeing that would have reignited like a spark in something in you as well, like that passion, that excitement, and just the joy mm -hmm. of seeing your students achieve something great. Yeah, yeah, they're they're so they're so good. I'm I'm in touch with a lot of them still oh, nice. on Facebook and like Instagram, and I just I, they they're so cute. They've all got like like one of my students just uh, hit just took his daughter to college. <laughs> oh, wow. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. I'm so old. But, um, but also they, they were, I mean, I was, when I did that job, I was like 23 or something. It was like 23, 24. And they were like 15 to 18. So there wasn't like a huge gap, you know, between us. Can you hear my son screaming in the background? Very, it's very little. It's, it's fine. Okay, we'll just pretend I live like on, in a war torn country. No, don't, don't, don't. Can you hear my girlfriend um, banging her pots? So no, nope, for one. No. Nope. Okay, that's great. So <laughs> after that two years are done, you moved to New York. Um. Yeah. 
Yes, I did. I moved to New York. So <laughs> as I was leaving, as I was packing out of my double wide trailer, that was my classroom. I had half of a double wide trailer. Um, I like overextended my knee and my knee swelled up to like the size of a grapefruit. And I wow. was like, no, I'm moving to New York. I can't have a swollen knee. And, uh, and uh, I went and had it like drained. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I, but I kept going and I ended up um, flying, I think like a month later to New York. And uh, I moved in with my, with, with one of my childhood best friends whose roommate had just kind of moved out. And I lived with her in this apartment um, for a couple months. And then uh, we moved out of that place and into a new place. And that's when I flew home and my mom and I drove like the big moving truck up the coast with all the, all my stuff. That is very exciting. And I assume improv came very quickly once you're in New York. Yeah, I think I moved in. So I think I moved in June or July and then I started taking classes at second city in September. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I was like, I got a backstage magazine, you know, paper, which is like where they list all the auditions. And I just started going to like every audition that I could and then I saw an ad that Second City was um, starting up a program. And I immediately was like, I'm doing this. I also was at the time doing, there's a, there was a New York version of the Teach for America program. And uh, so I got a job working for them as kind of a, an advisor to incoming teachers. And it turned out my now husband was in one of my g- groups, was in the group with me. Um, And that's how we ended up meeting. Um, That's great. uh, And I did that for two months. The first month was like we were in classes, kind of like crash course in teaching and educational theory, which is largely unhelpful when you're standing in front of a class of terrifying students. (laughs) And then uh, the second month I did like site visits and I would go to like high schools all over, all over New York, like the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, and do like visit, like do observations of, of the teachers from the program to make sure that they weren't drowning, um, and to get, get them support and give them feedback about what I saw in the classroom. Yeah. So I'm still trying to get the timeline. This is very interesting. Were you also a waiter at the time or you teach? Then no. So then I, after the teaching advisorship thing, which was called the New York City Teaching Fellows, which was just like July and August, because then they started in schools. No, August, September. Yep. Then I enrolled in Second City. Is that right? I don't know. And then uh, I got a job also working for something called the O'Neill Playwrights Conference, but it was part time. And it was, uh, so it was like 20 hours a week and I was sort of like an administrative person and I was organizing, but it was all of these playwrights from around the world were submitting their work. And then if they were chosen to be like the 10 or 12 playwrights, they would go to the O'Neill Playwrights Conference in the summer and have their works staged in a workshop production. And they had writers in residence like August Wilson, Lee Blessing, like all of these really super famous, amazing, Regina Taylor, um, I'm forgetting, Dan O'Brien, like, uh, who's actually Jessica St. Clair's husband. Um, And so I worked for that for two years, but that was part-time. And then I also, to supplement my income, waited tables at the Bull Moose Saloon, like three nights a week. Okay. That is, that is incredible. And also, so now that you've gone back to improv, I love this story because this is the traditional story. And I think it's really important. Like literally every single guest didn't just go to the top uni or college, whatever you call it. And then they become number one on the call sheet and then they're earning $10 million a year. You have an amazing story and I love it. When you went back to improv, did it ignite? You know, you mentioned lit you up. Did it lit you up straight away and it all came back for you? Yeah. You know, I had done second city, second city felt really good to me. There's a lot of like slow 
like development of character, which is what I felt like I was good at. And Mm -hmm. then, but second city was in a transitional period and they didn't have like a concrete, like they didn't have a space. They didn't have like a home base for students. Like they Uh were renting out space in another place that was near NYU. And so a couple of the people that I was doing it with still some of my best friends today uh, Leslie Mizell, um, Molly Prather, Tony Rodriguez, they, they were, a couple of them were on teams at the Upright Citizens Brigade and they had a theater, a proper theater, and they had audiences sold out every night. Wow. And so I was like, well, let me go see what that's all about. And so I went and I actually, <laughs> Leslie and Molly and I performed in a three man improv tournament and I literally had never other than second city had not performed improv since high school wow except in my Juilliard audition but like we know all know how that went poorly (laughs) it could have gone really well and (laughs) um yeah and the the judges were Matt Walsh and Ian Roberts and Sean Conroy on the podcast anyway Uh, And so then I started taking class at UCB because I was like, this place has a real vibe to it. And like, I would get to perform here if I got on a team. And so I started taking class. But at first, the classes, I was like, this is is too jokey. It's too quick. It's like, how are you going to like nestle down into a juicy character work? Like you can't, it was all zip, zap, zap. It was all like quick and, you know, edit and come up with a new game. And I was just like, not sure about it, but I had a level two teacher, Michael Delaney, who was really encouraging of me. And after I finished his class and I was thinking about level three, but I was like, maybe this isn't for me. He sent a message through my friend and said, tell Lennon, she needs to come back and keep taking classes because we really need funny women. Oh, And so I did because of that, I went and signed up for level three and, um, had Billy Merritt and then my level three B or whatever, I had Julie Brister. And it was during that class that I got on an improv team, Herald team. And that was my, my, like all my best friends, like Anthony King, Zach Woods, Sarah Burns, Eric Tenoy, Risa Sangarai, like it. Brett Christensen, Joe Winger, like it was just a uh, very a average murder, comedians, murderers. <laughs> row. Um, and we just immediately all fell in love with one another. And um, yeah, and that was kind of the, re- the, his- the rest is history. Do you think you would have continued if the teacher didn't say we need you to continue? I don't, maybe not at UCB. I might've gone somewhere else or, maybe I would have found my way back to it somehow. Cause I think performing felt really good to me. And there was, you know, there were all, all these little indie theaters and places that you could also perform improv, but um, you really had to hustle to get an audience. And uh, I was, I was on a team called Carl with a K, <laughs> Carl with a K. that was performing at basically off 42nd street at what used to be a strip theater and like it was like a raised stage with like these mirrored poles in the middle like <laughs> um and you couldn't get yeah. a crowd with that i'm su- surprised no, the I old mean, clientele we would be at, yeah exactly uh, did exactly, they exactly michael i'm sure they did and they were very <laughs> sorely disappointed <laughs> i uh once when i went to my I went upstairs. I, I forget where I was going. I think I was going to see a comedy show and I went to the wrong place and they've got a couch and people performing level one improv and I'm just watching yeah. them. They're looking at me and no one knows what's going on, but I didn't think I could leave. So they're doing their whole like level one scene and they're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm here to see the comedy show. And like, no, this is a level one class. I'm like, okay. And that's pretty much how I started improv. <laughs> that's uh, amazing. And so you then become an improv guru and you, you can be modest all you like. And now you're going into the acting world and well, you're already in the acting yeah. world, but you're applying for um, like TV shows and movies and all of that stuff. The word yeah. no would come up way more than yes. And you've got a very interesting sure. relationship with no now. How did you cope yeah. from that? 
because it sounds like you're very resilient with everything that's gone on. And now you're at this that's stage. That's nice. Yeah, you know, I don't know where this comes from, but I, I definitely felt like deep, deep, deep inside <laughs> that this was a meant to be journey for me oh, nice. and that I was supposed to be doing this. And I was getting little signs along the way from the universe or whatever that I was in the, I was on the right track. Cool. Um, you know, but I, but I was also getting a lot of bad advice, a lot of no's, a lot of like, you know, people who, you know, cause when you're at that kind of nascent level, like, you just really don't know, you know, which end is up. And luckily I had people who had gone before me who recognized in me something and wanted to help. And like Jack McBrayer, who I've already mentioned, and my good friend, Jason Manzukas, mm. they kind of shepherded me through some of those times. Um, and I, you know, without them, I wouldn't have stepped up to the next level or I wouldn't have made, I would have made some kind of crazy decisions, you know? Um, like, so like once, well, one of the, th one of the ways the universe was speaking to me was I, I had auditioned, I, I had gotten a manager and that was like a really big deal. Mm. Cause I finally had somebody sending me out for things that were not commercials, which I was so thankful for the commercials because they, they paid my rent. Like they, I could do two, three commercials a year and pay my rent. And, um, and so that was, that was great. Um, but I had gotten an audition for this movie called confessions of a shopaholic. And I had gotten, it was like a two line part and it was through my manager. And so I wanted to get a call back or do well for it, you know, so that they could then send me out for more bigger parts or whatever. So, um, I went in and it was this casting director, Denise Chamian, who I want to circle back to her. Um, and I did my two line part audition and I made her laugh and she was like, you're, you're funny. And she brought me back in for the director and he was like, you're funny. <laughs> and then he was like, I want you to read for this bigger role. And so they sent me out into back into the like holding area, the waiting room with new sides. And I came back in in like 10 minutes and like off the cuff in, you know, um, auditioned for this brand new, larger role that was meant for a totally different physical oh, person so than cool. me. But I, I knew that they thought I was funny. And so I just did what I thought was going to be funny. And then I ended up getting that. And that was like my first kind of big role um, and I play like a shopaholic, uh, and got to see myself in the theater and stuff. And it was so, and I remember this one day, cause I was, I was at this place where I was like figuring out like, like, how do I, this, you know, this super weirdo inside, but looks like a mom on the outside or looks like she's still 12, but she's really like 31. <laughs> Um, <laughs> how do I, like, how do I fit into all of this madness, you know? And it was our lunch break and I was sitting around a circle, uh, table with Joan Cusack, Wendy Malick, um, this other, the woman who was in airplane, the actress from airplane, but I can't remember her name, Julie. Um, this other woman, Clea, Devon. who were all, they were all for like at different levels of a character actress's very successful career. And I was like, it just like my mind blew open. And I was like, oh my God, this, I could do this. Uh. Like if I, if I could do this for the rest of my life, I would be so happy. If I could have any one of these women's careers, you know, like. Like, this is what I'm meant to do. I'm a funny character actress, you know, like, and I shouldn't be auditioning for like, 
the ingenue or the main, you know, the, the, you know, I should be this person who's bringing all this creative comedic color to it. So anyway, um, that's awesome. That was kind of an aha moment. Yeah. And then after that, th- that same manager, like threatened to like, <laughs> like fire me. And l- later I was like, and then they wanted me to sign a three-year contract and Jack and Manzuka both stepped in and were like, no, 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 no. You're at this very specific point in your career. If you sign with these people for three years, you'll be locked into them and you won't be able to get like the next level of representation. They were like, do not sign with them. And I was like, ah, but if I don't sign with them, I don't have anybody else. Like it's just a total leap of faith. And so I went back in and I said, you know, I've been talking, you know, some, some people that I trust and they just, they're advising me not to sign with you. And, and so what I'll do is I'll sign for a year. And the woman was like, what are you, what are you doing? And I was like, what? And she was like, I'm taking a risk on you. You're past your prime. You're in your thirties. And here I am sending you out and you're telling me that, you know, and I was just like, and then after that, she called my commercial agent, who was the person that she thought had given me this advice and, and handed her a new asshole. And then the, my commercial agent emailed me and was like, why did this woman just call me and, and, and go crazy on me? And I was, and, and then I had to say, listen, we're, we're done because mm-hmm. good for you. you've had now bad behavior after bad behavior and you've also jeopardized my only source of income. Like, no, sir. Wow. And so I left, I left them. And I, just like Jack and Manzuka said, I took my one woman show. I took it to LA. I didn't have any representation. I did it within a month. I had my, my still now manager and my still now agent. Okay. So, Brilliant. Oh yeah. Go on. Yeah. No, uh- that's it. I was just saying that is brilliant and it's very nice to know and that you, you know, you've done all the work and you deserve the success, but you have had people along the way that through loving advice, yes, you have the other people, but to be able to say yeah, no yeah. and follow yeah. what I think you might yeah. call iterations or following the signs that like l- light you up and you're obviously very intuitive. Yeah. And I think it's just epic that because you can come from a huge place of fear and totally. I'm not judging anyone, you, you know, you, you not getting a manager is extremely hard. And yeah. this lady could say all the things to you, but you might be like, you know what? She owns me, but you still had that in you. And not only yeah. did you tell her like F off probably in a nice way, you did a one person show. <laughs> and that I'm one sure person I... show is so <laughs> awesome because it does, you, know, you mentioned it got your representation, but it was also yeah. a way for you to be seen in another light. And this industry totally. does box you in. And I thought that was epic. So I've just said a lot. Was that what you were thinking? (laughs) Were you just like, I have to follow my passion? Or you scared? You're terrified? What's going on? Yeah, I was terrified. I, you know, I was, I started working with a career coach actually at the time prior to the show. Um, I had done, I had got, I don't even know how this came to be, but I had started working, uh, in a theater company with Dan Fogler, yep. who you know him from the Dumbledore films. He's a great actor. Um, and the I had Dead. done like a, pro- oh yeah, I don't watch, I can't watch that. <laughs> yeah, um, anyway, uh, his wife and her sister started a, co- a career coaching and, and, you know, like a creative career coaching company. And I was like on the ground floor of it with them. And I started working with, it's called Capes Coaching. And I started working with Betsy and it really transformed how I looked at everything in my career because it was, uh, honestly the amount of up of like lifting it took to like get a career off the ground Mm. felt like overwhelming. And also like, how could I have any healthy balance in my life? How can I have a family? How could I be a a good wife to my husband? How could I have healthy relationships? How can I then also make a living? So she helped me kind of uh, set some really healthy goals and create some balance in my life. 
but also allowed me to say no to things that weren't serving me anymore. And, uh, and also we set this goal that I was going to, cause my goal was to, to get on SNL. Yes. And she was like, how are we going to get there? And I was like, well, I have to have characters. And she was like, well, how are you going to do that? And I was like, well, I'll start working on them now. And so we started to create this whole thing. And that led to my one woman show, which was really a way for me to show, like I said, I look like a, whatever I look like on the outside, like a pretty normal person, (laughs) but on the inside, it's just insanity and, um, (laughs) and dark comedy, you know? And so I, I really wanted to show, you know, in my character show, kind of like the depths of myself and that I wasn't kind of boxed in by what I look like and that, um, yeah, so my, it was a, it was insane and it was terrifying. And I, I just couldn't like, I kind of couldn't wrap my mind around that all these folks would come to see just me Mm -hmm. like that it was that that was enough you know um and so that was a big leap for me and and I started to have like fear before the shows and I um Betsy helped me come up with like a mantra um so anytime that kind of fear would come up I would kind of like take a deep breath and I would do a physical uh like a physical motion of just like my clenched fist and I would punch it down kind of. And I would say to myself, trust and go. Mm -hmm. And I would just like before the show, you know, like you're supposed to be here. You have the skills, just fucking do this shit. And, um, and that's been really helpful. I haven't said that in a while, but uh, I'm, I think I do it in other ways in my life. How awesome that coaching service sounds amazing because you do hear like certain yeah. coaching services so they don't provide tangible advice, but this is like holistic advice, not just necessarily career. Like what can you actually do? I'm very, yeah. very proud of them for figuring that out and you for doing the work. <laughs> and in terms yeah, of- It was terrifying at the time because I, it cost money. Like it cost yeah. money that felt like I didn't have. And so I was like on a payment plan with them uh, waiting table, like not, you know, figuring out how to pay for everything. But, um, but I, it was like the amount of time and money that I spent specifically on my career. I feel like it really paid off, um, hugely in the long run. Yeah. Well, it's an investment in yourself that you carry on. Even if you didn't go into acting or improv, I'm sure those skills still carry on in other ways as well. Yeah, for sure. So in terms of SNL, this is what I find mm-hmm. remarkable. You know, you've done this one woman show to show the world that you're not just whatever yeah. they think you are to change the perception game. Cause that Hollywood loves that game. Right. And you go out there, you show your weirdness, which is amazing. And then you don't get into SNL, which is so many people's yeah. dreams. I yeah. have heard you also say that it was like a blessing in disguise. My words, you don't get in. Yeah. What was it like when you don't get it? Well, I mean, Michael, I, I didn't just not get it. I didn't get an audition. Like I never got like, I never even got close. And that was almost more frustrating because I felt like I was like, what am I, what am I doing wrong here? Like, I feel like I've checked all the boxes. Like I just don't understand. And then, you know, I had, there was a showcase at the UCB here in LA and I, did two of my characters and like no shade I killed. Like I really, like it was like it killed. And then I still didn't get an in-person audition. I put myself on tape three years running and you know, that was, that was really hard. Um, But at the same time, Jessica and I had started to write together and um, you know, I know, I know people that have done SNL. I know how taxing it is. I know what it requires of you. And obviously show running your own show is also equally difficult, but I think my life would have been very different had I gotten, you know, the audition and gotten on the show or whatever. But like, 
it's sort of a, I mean, it's a blessing in disguise, but again, I didn't like, I never, <laughs> never like even got stu- into whatever studio eight H I think is. You're also being like a little I, bit modest because they yeah. did see your tapes and they said you look too like, um, was it Kirsten? What's her name? Kristen Wig. Yes. And so yeah, that's you going further than you think you are. Well, when I heard that someone, someone saw it. Yeah. So, I mean, at that showcase in LA, Lorne was there and Seth Meyers was there and I had been performing in improv shows with Seth Meyers. So he knew me pretty well. And, um, and yeah, when we pushed them for feedback, that was what we, that was the answer that we got. But I, that's kind of, I don't know if that's like it, if that's the case, like, why would you not want to have like multiple Kristen wigs on your show? But I, I agree. But then again, I, I think there may have been something else that they were just not seeing in me that w- totally, I get it. And, and also I, I don't know if I'm the right, you know, temperament for that. Like, you know, so yeah, I think it was, it, it went the way it was supposed to go. Okay. I love that. And this is where <laughs> It gets even more interesting because, you know, we, we're talking about resilience and really trusting the universal, whatever your place is, going through all of yeah. these, let's say, hardships. There's a lot that's happened. And now your career is taking off. You form the best duo in Hollywood with Jessica St. Clair. <laughs> I think you met her through improv. And I'm just going to give a, bit, a little bit of a snapshot and then we'll get into what this does for you. You meet her maybe yeah. at improv and she like gives you advice. Then you guys like fall in love as best friends. And now you actually start writing and you're getting shows, which is crazy. Who would have thought of from where you were starting that you would be like a showrunner yeah. and executive and a writer and star in yeah. your own shows, have amazing connections. Do you ever look yeah. back and be like, how did I get there? It's a, it's a pretty clear path, but like, I don't think when we started out, I didn't know how impossible like the odds were. And I, and I also, I didn't like, as it was happening, it felt amazing, but I also didn't know like how truly incredible it was what we were doing because, uh, and, and I, it, it took us, it took me a little while to kind of really realize that and, and pay homage to it because, you know, we met, we met at UCB, but like, we didn't really know each other very well. And I was out in LA doing, doing pilots, you know, here by myself. And I, we hung out a couple of times and then we were like, should we try to write something together? And then we immediately like we're falling on the floor laughing. Like it was just a match made in heaven. I think she's one of the most incredibly talented, funniest women working today. That is or, awesome. You know, and, and also she's like stunning, which is just rude. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just stop? Um, Sorry for cutting you off. I do screenwriting. I'm not saying that as like a humble brag. And the amount of people have said, let, we should write together and nothing happens. Or when you do, it's like one day. So for you guys to actually yeah. say we should write together and yeah. do it, that's already beating yeah. the odds of SNL. True, true, true. So we, yeah, we just like would get like lunch, go eat turkey chili and then just like brainstorm and then be laughing and sort of write it all down. And then we ended up coming up with an idea and we shared the same manager. And so we went out um, and, and pitched this idea as a television show. Uh, And then this is, yeah. mm -hmm, Our manager, Christy Smith, who's phenomenal. Oh, she's like the best in the business. She's the best in the biz. Yeah, for sure. She, um, so then we pitched it to like, at that time there were no streamers. It was, so it was like five places you pitch the four networks and HBO and HBO, um, decided to pay us to write it, which was insane. And at the same time, we both got on shows. We both got on, uh, sitcoms. Um, mine was the aforementioned Jenna Elfman show and hers, uh, was, what was it? Tales from the motherhood or something like that in the motherhood. Um, and so we were both on those shows and then I kept kind of 
like it felt like LA was calling. I was still living in New York. My husband is at that point, a high school principal. And um, I was going back and forth. I went back and forth from LA to New York for two years. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, that was a, that was a tough time um, because both my husband and I were having these like great growth in our careers and it was, but we were apart and that felt really bad. And so mm. we ended up deciding to move to LA and as we were driving, like literally we had moved everything out of our apartment. Is this right? No, before that, before that. I, I left an improv show. I remember we, my husband had given notice. We had given notice on our apartment and I got a call as I was leaving that our HBO script had been passed on. And then the next day my TV show was canceled. And so I was like, okay, like <laughs> I'm already, we're already doing this. So. As he's moving, as you, as yeah. Everything's yeah. in alignment. Yes, yes, yes. So Jess and I kind of like quickly got our ducks in a row. We came up with a new idea. Um, and then while I was in LA looking for apartments, she and I took out the idea for Best Friends Forever. And then we ended up partnering with this amazing production company, American Work, that was Scott Armstrong and Robbie Nanden, who then also produced Playing House. And... Uh, And then we got a first look deal through them at NBC to write this pilot for best friends forever. And I got that news about the first look deal on our cross country drive to move to LA. Wow. That's quick. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was like over a couple months. So, so then when I moved out here and I was, you know, writing basically writing and auditioning. Um, And my husband was the principal of a high school out here. In LA. There's okay. There's so many things and we'll see if we can get through all of them. When you've already packed your bags and you're moving, I don't know if your husband was, did he get, did he have a job lined up? So once he gave his notice in New York, there was an organization that was affiliated with his school there that has schools in LA and they didn't want to lose him. And so they were like, we want you to meet with this school they're looking for a principal and so he flew out and met them and Uh, uh, and fell in love with the school and and decided to do that so that was like in the works so he knew he had that so he was the principal and he became the principal at the other school okay that that's great but in terms of okay this first of all a huge huge credit to you to be able to have that i wouldn't say power because that can be a dirty word but you know your show gets rejected and then yeah. you and Jessica, you know, you go to town, you work, you create another idea, you go to yeah. other networks, you can actually get the meeting. People, yeah, I've only ever had one meeting in my life with sort of Netflix and <laughs> yeah. that's not easy. And you just, you know, you guys, I'm sure you're going through all the negative game and the chitter chatter. Will I ever be able to do this again? Am I good enough? All of that stuff. Or yeah. maybe you're a super yeah. human did you actually, did you have that? Or like, how did you quick, like two months later, like to just get everything rolling? Tell me your well, secrets. Yeah. Well, we knew that the genesis of the idea was good, but it was like it needed to be tweaked. And we understood why they were passing on it. I think um, the, the double whammy of, of, of our shows getting canceled, because her show also got canceled at the same time was a pretty, was a pretty hard blow. Um but like the, the wheels were already in motion and it felt like, okay, well, this is still happening. And I know that this partnership is solid. So like, let's see what we can do with the like ashes of this project and see if we can create something else. And so that, that idea was actually about friends that are too close that they're, they're ruining each other's lives. They like already live together And so then we sort of turned that on its head and uh, yeah, I mean, I still remember scenes from it that make me laugh, but um, then we turned that on its head to become this thing about two best friends that don't live together who are forced back together for outside reasons and how that complicates their, their current relationships. 
Okay. And we'll have and to do a also what playing house is about too, but that, sort of, sort of. We'll have to do a part two to get really into it because you know you become the showrunner, <laughs> the executive, and there's just so much stuff that happened there. Huge credit to yeah. you. Know, I really mean that because that's yeah. my dream and that's a lot of people's dreams. But to even just do yeah. one aspect, you could just be the writer, yeah. but you're also starring it, and then you're yeah. doing the show running. Yeah. I know it almost killed you. And I know I think at one yes. stage I'm probably getting well, the timeline a bit wrong. You're having a child. I think you and Jessica have gone to hospital a few times. Yeah, How did we, you just, can you yeah. give a brief summary of all of the, let's say hardships that you experienced and how you actually won? I see this as a, a huge win. So with the first show, Best Friends Forever was a six episode order. We'd already written the pilot. It had been shot, right? And we shot it for f- like under $500,000, which is insane. Oh, we yeah. flew an eight-year-old to New York and shot without permits on the street. And that aired on <sighs> NBC. Okay? okay. That's what we're talking about. Yep. But we did not know the rules. We did not know what we were not supposed to do. We did not know either how to set healthy boundaries. In terms and of. And so for ourselves, like yep. where to draw the line, like how much of ourselves to give. Mm. And so during that process, we both ended up either in the ER or in urgent care. Uh, I, I went twice when we were filming in New York because I got all over body hives. Uh, From the stress? I think so. But um, I, had, I had taken it upon myself to go get a Thai massage like the day before we were editing. And um, everywhere that she'd put the lotion like lit up like with hives. But I think it was connected to stress for sure. Yeah. Um, but like it made for a good story, like expired Victoria's Secret body lotion. But um, <laughs> yeah, and Jess got like really bad food poisoning and she had to be like rehydrated. It was really crazy. But oh, we wow. were like burning the candle at both ends. We were working all day, all night, all weekend. Um, and then uh, that was just the, that was the writer's room. And then we were shooting it. Oh, and yeah. then, and then, you know, they air it and they pair it with an Betty White's old person prank show. And I was like, wait a second, like, how are we being taken care of? Like, we're literally giving our like full, like blood. And then the show at the time, you know, like now it would have been a raging success, but at the time it like wasn't great did did not do great and then they pulled it we were still editing the last two episodes and they did ultimately air all the episodes but the thing that happened the minute they canceled it was i was like i got to i got to have some balance here like i cannot this cannot be the only thing i care about in my life i was like i got to get pregnant cuz i've been putting it off you know? And so, so I did, I got pregnant. Oh, wow. Um, And that was, I was eight months pregnant when we shot the pilot for playing house, which was for the USA network. And that was my real daughter in my real belly (laughs) when we shot that show, which is about two best friends that moved back in together when one of them's pregnant and her husband is found to be cheating on her. And she like drops everything and helps her raise the baby. Very cool. So there's, there's obviously a lot that's gone on there. We're going to have to do a part two to really, (laughs) I like that you bring up balance because I know that firsthand that when I've been doing this, I can go laser like vision working on my shows and it's the only thing that's important. But when you've got something else that takes away from the seriousness of what's going on, and I assume, and I've heard you talk about how your child did that as well. Yeah. I'm wondering what was the key takeaway from this experience? There would have been a thousand, but is there one that stuck with you? Uh, you know, it's tricky because like, I, I, I recognize this when I see somebody doing their first project, like you kind of have to go through the experience of like giving it all to know where your limit is. Yep. And, you know, I could say like, I learned healthy boundaries, which I did, but like, I couldn't have told myself ahead of time, like make sure you have healthy boundaries because I just had to give it all. You know, I had like, we had to sacrifice it. 
That's how um, humans learn is often through pain. And then if we're smart, we don't do it again. Yeah. And the loss of that show felt so profound, like, because it, we had worked on it, you know, for a long time, like, you know, enough time that it felt like our baby and we, we protected it. And, you know, anytime there was trouble, we, we hid it from everybody. Like we really tried to like shepherd it in, in this way. And we really succeeded against all odds. When I look back at it, I'm like, how the hell did we ever get a show on air? And that's, that, that also is profound, but like, Mm -hmm. I was so deeply sad when it was over. And I was like, this is going to keep happening. Ups and downs, losses, wins. And I just like, what am I, like, if I feel it this deeply, is, is, there, is there something else? Like, do I want to give this kind of thing this much importance in my life? And sometimes the answer was yes, you know? Um. But for me, the answer was not that much, not that much importance. It's not, it's comedy. We're making comedy and it is important. I do think comedy in the world is important, but I, it it shouldn't come at my own personal sacrifice of health or happiness or my family's, you know. Oh, that is brilliant. We found the theme of the podcast right there. That is, that's a thousand (laughs) lessons in one. What we're going to do to wrap up the podcast because we, oh, there's just so much to say, but I love you. This is amazing. And this is great inspiration for me. So oh, good. with this rapid fire, the first yeah. thing that springs to mind, but if you okay. need a second to think about it, that's completely fine. I'll only okay. ask a few. What yeah. are you most proud of? Um. Like from my career, do, can I, do I narrow it in my whole life? Whole life. Oh, shit. Uh, I, I think I'm, oh man. I think I'm most proud of the, of, of this life that I built where, where I have, you know, I have a happy, healthy family and I can do what I love to provide for them. And, uh, and I get to go to work with people who make me laugh and inspire me. I'm not going to comment on them because I'll derail them. What's that face? Okay. That's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. That's amazing. Is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's, that is amazing. What's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Mm. Oh, man, my special. I guess like, like, like finding my own special sauce and like, what is the way that I do it that nobody else can do it and then bring that to the thing. Cause then they'll need it again. Cause it's only, you can do it. What would you knew if you knew you could not fail? What would I do? If you knew you I... could not fail. Um, I don't know. Start a midwifery practice. (laughs) Can you expand on that? I just, I find the (laughs) the mysteries of birth really fascinating. Um, I don't know. That's a real tangent, Michael. uh, My cousin's a midwife, so I find it also very interesting. I think you talked about midwifery and Jean's podcast. I, yeah, I, Uh, I think, yeah, I really, um, yeah, I think I would, I would want to have a hand in bringing children into the world. I don't know. That's crazy. Michael, I don't know. I think that would be great. So next time we speak that, that better be on the cards. Okay. (laughs) Um, Any advice you'd like to give to people who want to try something different or new, but perhaps are a bit fearful of doing so? Um, Yeah, I think. I think you just have to take a deep breath and go for it. Like whatever the thing is, like once you've done it, if you don't like it, you never have to do it again. But if, but if you feel like it's calling, you don't want to have that regret. So just like try. (laughs) These are great. I I, I don't want to comment because I'll derail them, but your face is hilarious. Um, 
And what advice would you give yourself when you were first starting out, if you would? Uh, I don't know. I mean, again, like I think I kind of had to like learn it along the way, but I guess I would say the thing that was like the little voice I could hear inside me was like, don't worry, it's coming for you, you know? And I think, yeah, I would just like say it louder or something. Oh, okay. Amazing. Uh, oh, you mentioned Denise. I forgot what her surname was. You wanted to come back to that. Denise Chamian. Okay. So Denise is an Im- incredible casting director. She's the one who, who saw something in me at Confessions of a Shopaholic. And she was actually, she came to the premiere of Minx, my most recent show and came up to me afterwards and was just so supportive and loving. And I was like, Oh my God, Denise, (laughs) like you gave me my first like thing. Like it just felt really full circle. And I, I think that there are those people out there. There are good people. You'll find them as you go. And then you just like kind of try to keep them close to you as you move through and um, you know, people that want the best for you and um, yeah. It makes the world a lot easier surrounding ourselves Mm. with people that we love. Yeah. This is the last question before I ask how people can follow you and keep up to date with you. What is the one question I should have asked you? Mm. (sighs) Okay. I remember you asked Jean this and I, uh, I love Jean, by the way. I think she's amazing. uh, She's the best. She's just the best. Um, Okay. What is the one question that you should have asked me? Oh, there was something. Uh, oh, to do, to do it. My, a terrible Australian accent. Can you do one? <laughs> terribly. That is it's like, I love doing accents. Australian. I always do. My friend, Tony does a really good New Zealand accent. Oh, that's <laughs> very good. I cannot. I was like, I only do, I, I watched this episode of like, there's a clip of uh, Australia's top model where, where, where she accidentally announces the wrong woman. Oh uh, yeah. As oh, the winner, have you seen that's it? Hilarious. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, that's how I always do. I go, oh, no, no, Becca, it's not you. <laughs> no, no, Becca. <laughs> Oh, that is brilliant. Oh, you should have added that to your SNL um, tape if it was well before. Oh, that was a big scandal here and I don't ever watch the show. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. I've got, okay. There's so much I can say to that. Do I have a, I, I think I have a soft accent. Do you? Yeah. Would you, would you say that you have an Australian accent or a South African accent? Um, Australian but people mm. don't pick it around the world. Okay. So that yeah. would have been really thick and my family have very thick accents. My girlfriend, yeah. unfortunately, is South African as well. It's a very <laughs> thick accent. I've just yeah. got really soft. No one can. I'm hoping that I could pass in the American space yeah. if I yeah. just tweaked a few things, but who knows? Maybe, maybe. But if Fingers you got crossed. here, only, people would only want you to speak in Australian. So <laughs> <laughs> Just say g'day, mate, like 20 yeah. times. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I could speak to you for another 30 billion hours. You're amazing. Ditto, you're resilient. Ditto. You're brilliant. I really appreciate your time. And oh, wait, before we go, how can people follow oh. you and keep up to date with you? Good old lemon parsnips at your service. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just my name at Lennon Parham uh, on Instagram and Twitter and uh, new season of Minx. Uh, we're filming this fall and you should watch the show somebody somewhere. I just directed a couple episodes uh, for HBO and that will come out. I don't know when, but watch season one if you haven't. And there's an, also another animated show called little demon that I do a voice for with Aubrey Plaza, Danny DeVito, Lucy DeVito. Jeez. And it was created by some, some old school UCB folks. And it's uh, insanely wonderful. And it'll be out on FX x on august 25th okay i'm going to check that one out as well so the episode notes that will all be in the episode notes below so people can check it out thank you so much you're amazing and we'll have to chat soon thanks michael 
This is a great story of inspiration and empowerment. I love how Lennon backed herself earlier in her career. The example of being at a dinner table with various successful ladies and how she came to the amazing and accurate realization that she would be okay being herself and didn't have to be someone else. That is, the leading lady or the person with particular looks. Lennon knew that she was different, like we all are, and instead of letting that impact her, she went out and showed the world that she was unique and that uniqueness should be celebrated. Creating her one-woman show and letting go of her manager was a brilliant story of taking ownership of herself and her career. This in turn showed the industry what Lennon was capable of. My takeaway is, back yourself. Go out and create something that you love and the rest will follow. So I'll leave you with this amazing quote by Mikhail Strabo. Only you can hold yourself back. Only you can stand in your own way. Only you can help yourself. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 